Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation with Professor Stephen Chu. Welcome also to the first full day of the Biden administration. Today, we'll be discussing the process of launching a new administration, including people, process, and coming up to speed on the major issues. I'm Chris Field, climate scientist and director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. The Woods Institute is Stanford's primary mechanism for bringing people together to discuss, develop, and deliver practical solutions to pressing environmental challenges. Through research, training, and events like this, we strive to chart a path for a sustainable future. Before we start the conversation, I want to take a moment for a brief plug about the next Woods Environmental Conversation. On Thursday, March 11th at noon, our guest will be Pat Brown, founder of Impossible Foods. I hope you can join us then. I'm thrilled today to be joined in Zoom World by Professor Stephen Chu, in addition to all of you. Stephen Chu is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Physics at Stanford and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford Medical School. He's one of the world's leading physicists with extensive discoveries in atomic and polymer physics, biophysics, biology, bioengineering, batteries, and other energy technologies. Dr. Chu's work has been widely recognized most notably with the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to laser cooling and atom trapping. Prior to his current positions at Stanford, Dr. Chu was the 12th US Secretary of Energy, serving from January 2009 until the end of April 2013. He was the first scientist to hold the cabinet position and the longest serving energy secretary. At DOE, Dr. Chu emphasized science and scientists. One of his most important tasks at DOE was leading the government contribution to stopping the Deepwater Horizon oil leak. And prior to his cabinet post, Dr. Chu held positions as director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, professor of physics and applied physics at Stanford University, and head of the quantum electronics research department at AT&T Bell Labs. Currently, Dr. Chu is the chairman of the board of directors of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, the format for today's session is conversational with a role for all of you in the audience, as well as for Steve and me. The plan is that I'll ask questions for about 25 minutes, and then we'll turn to questions from you. Entered in the Q&A window for another 25 minutes. My goal for today is to launch a shared sense of what it's like to launch a new administration. What's the preparation like and what are the unexpected challenges? Steve, maybe we can talk for a few minutes about the first day on the job. When you go into the department for the first time or when Secretary Granholm does when she's confirmed, what do you actually do? <laughs> At first you introduce yourself. Uh, and But really when I entered, uh, the economy was in free fall. There was uh, a large hunk of discretionary money, about $34 billion uh, to stimulate the economy. And the plan was to use that 34 billion allocated for the Department of Energy to, to actually stimulate the economy in ways that could potentially have some uh, importance and lasting impact, but, but really just get jobs going. Um, and, uh, and so in that those first day or three, you, there's, there are no political appointees. There are roughly 100, 140 political appointees in the Department of Energy of which, you know, secretary, deputy secretary, assistant secretaries uh, are Senate confirmed. And, and so I had been confirmed a week before the inauguration, which was good. Uh, and so I was able to start uh, the very next day, uh, but, but some of the other confirmations take a while. And so you're really there sort of trying to man the ship in a very interesting way. And I'll just end with this one story. Uh, we were launching RPE. This is Advanced Project Research uh, for Energy. Something that had been recommended in a report that I would participate in 2005, 2006, um, rising above the gathering storm. I was sent by the National Academies to Congress to convince Congress to authorize it also sent to the Department of Energy to convince the Department of Energy to embrace it. And at the time they authorized it, but they didn't appropriate funds from the Department of Energy, the career folks did not want to embrace it uh, because they were afraid it might make the Department of Energy more applied. Um, and so uh, 
So that was then, 2006. In 2009, the new secretary had a very different view of RPE. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and, um, and we used Recovery Act money to fund $200 million a year for two years. Um, and after that, if it was successful, the hope would be that Congress would appropriate funds. Um, in the first call for proposals, there was nobody. Uh, and so uh, in getting the staff RP, I was actually making phone calls myself, uh, <laughs> checking references. Uh, and we sent a letter out to all the deans and provosts of uh, research universities that would have research appropriate and said, just give us names of people who you might think would be good referees. Don't, don't ask them. Uh, and we, we got a whole bunch of names. And in some of these, I actually called up too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Great. we got outstanding referees uh, in this first go around while we were building up the staff of RPE. The first, um, the first employee of RPE was a, a young graduate from MIT who listed the president of uh, MIT as the primary reference. So I said, you gotta be kidding. How does, how does the president of your MIT know this um, undergraduate? But I knew the president of MIT. So I got on the phone, Susan, tell me about Dave Danielson. <laughs> And she said, oh, he's wonderful. And she started talking about that. I said, oh my God, we're, you know, hire number one, done. <laughs> and so it was things like that, uh, um, that um, when there's nobody around, you've got to do a lot of the stuff yourself. <laughs> can, can you help us a, a little bit understand uh, what happens with acting people, particularly since um, confirmations are kind of behind schedule now with the Biden administration. So for your senior staff who were not yet confirmed when you started as secretary, what are they authorized to do? What are they not? Are people actually doing their jobs as, as, as acting? Yes. Uh, so uh, I've also forgot. To, yes. Very good question. Actings don't have nearly the influence and power. The, the career people in agencies don't really take them that seriously. Whereas if, if, uh, and so you've got to be very careful about actings. Um, and so that was some of the things. The, uh, now, I did make some decisions. The head of the, the, the nuclear, National Nuclear Security Agency uh, um, is it's, it's involved with all the nuclear and weapons stuff. I thought that was, person was a good person. So I told him, you, know, you can stay. And he did stay for the entire time I was there. And he was excellent. This is a person who is a political appointee. Uh, he was a political appointee. So there are a few political appointees that were, you know, there was not an issue whatsoever. Um, and so, so uh, and that was at the third level downs or secretary, deputy secretary, undersecretary. So it was, it was quite high. So, so there's a few of those that you said, oh, no problem at all. These are good people. Uh, just as President Obama kept the secretary of defense from the Bush administration. And, and when, when you went in on, on the first day in a time of crisis, just as we're in a time of crisis now, uh, were the priorities pretty much set by the administration or did you have a wide spectrum of, of decision-making that was required in order to align the Department of Energy with the administration's priorities? I, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, the amount of budget uh, that we we're getting for the stimulus package was set. Um, how you execute on that was not set. And so how, how you determine, for example, um, uh, how much of that would be used for weatherization, how much of that would be used for uh, uh, underwriting loans, things of that nature. Uh, the loan program actually had that required a congressional authorization of what sort of uh, potential losses the country would be willing to uh, tolerate. Uh, they were willing to tolerate 10 billion in losses. In the end, uh, we lost a billion, but it's not as bad as that because uh, we were gaining money on the loans that were coming through. 
the verdict is not in, but it will be probably very close to zero, uh, uh, less than a billion of losses or gains. Wow. Um, and so there are many things that were to be determined. One of the first things I did do is I appointed a special advisor. So that means not confer Senate confirmation. And it was actually to help oversee uh, specifically the stimulus package. Uh, so a person I got to know in the transition uh, who was from McKinsey, a uh, very, very good person. And so, so those were some of the things that uh, were happening. And when, when you think about running a big agency like the Department of Energy, how much of what happens is, is just the day-to-day uh, -day activities that, that continue more or less unchanged from administration to administration and how much is a result of the, of the new initiatives that you bring in as secretary? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, RP was a new initiative. Um, there were other things later on, a, a program called Sunshot uh, was taking an ex existing um, investments within Department of Energy, but under a few core new leaders that uh, again were uh, in part personally recruited by me. Uh, and, and so with this only four new members, uh, I started getting feedback and said, what happened? You revitalized, you've totally changed the way we support solar energy. Did your budget double? What happened? And I said, no, I didn't. Uh, we're spending more wisely. We got rid of all the K Street consultants that the Department of Energy was built up over the years of you know, not so good habits <laughs> uh, because I wanted the people in the department to actually do the work, not to hire some consultant. Uh, and, and, and that was actually, actually it was a very uplifting uh, thing for many of the members of the department. Uh, maybe the lower five or 10% didn't like that at all because all of a sudden you really had to work 30 hours a week. <laughs> and, and those people transferred to other agencies, <laughs> which was fine. Uh, the people brought in, some of them were work, you know, academic type hours, 60 hours a week, uh, which is also unheard of in government. Uh, but that was kind of the spirit that was growing while the time I was there. And, and how much do you feel like uh, being a scientist and, and encouraging scientist-like approaches to jobs changed the culture? And, and how much of your job was sort of setting the culture versus setting these more concrete initiatives? A lot of it was setting the culture. Um, my philosophy was I tried to identify very, very good people, uh, brought in people that normally would never consider working in the government. Uh, Arun Majumdar at Stanford in mecha uh, mechanical engineering is a good, great example. Uh, Ramesh at Berkeley uh, in physics and um, material science, another example. So there were, you know, roughly a half a dozen people who were in the National Academies of Science and Engineering, many elected when they were in their early 40s, uh, but a couple of them were still in their early middle 40s. And so you can imagine uh, someone who's getting elected to the you know, the highest level uh, honorific society in the United States, uh, they don't usually work in government. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so we had, and then those people with me, we, we would say, okay, who else do we want? And build up some key people. It doesn't take that many. And, and then I said, my job is mostly bringing good people, don't second guess them, and block and tackle for them, which means literally um, keep the bureaucracy from stopping or slowing them down and, and let them spread their wings. Uh, and so the people, uh, room is a great example is just spread his wings uh, yeah. it but not ignoring what he was doing in fact we brainstormed a lot we brainstormed a room and i brainstormed with the 
program managers within uh, RPE, he also had a philosophy never to second guess. But the way you actually have uh, assert some influence is we would ask questions. And, and the type of questions were deep penetrating questions that kept everybody honest. Mm -hmm. so, so all of a sudden it's all technically based. It's like, and as a scientist, you're up there at a conference and you're proposing something that might be not within the center of the dogma that the people are believing at the time, you know, you're gonna get a lot of questions. And so that was one of the things. The, the other thing, the culture thing, I was really formed in the nine years I spent at Bell Laboratories where there was absolutely no rank. Uh, you could have a postdoc be questioning a director, executive director, um, and disagreeing in a seminar setting. Uh, and it was not your rank within the organization. It was what you were saying. It was the content of your ideas uh, that ruled the day. And that's what uh, I wanted to establish uh, at the Department of Energy. And, uh, and it, it was moving in that direction. And it's something like RPE where you can create out of whole cloth. You just start it that way. And one person regard, referred to it as constructive confrontation. Uh, it would be as blunt as, no, I, I think that's BS. I don't believe that. Uh, but there would be an open discussion about it. It's not taken personally and Rune did something very important. Friday, uh, late afternoons, they all uh, went to a favorite watering hole <laughs> and became all good friends. <laughs> Uh, so you can have honest discussions without it getting personal. And, and, and how pervasive do you think that kind of approach to management was in the Obama administration? And do you have a comment on, on what we're seeing in the Biden administration? I have no idea in terms of the different agencies. I think many uh, of the others kept the formal top-down approach. Uh, you know, in academia and, or places like Bell Labs, it's very flat organization. You know, a professor doesn't feel like the, the chair, the dean, the provost, the president could, you know, say, no, you're wrong about something uh, of in the academic debate, right? Uh, there is no rank in a university regarding that. I mean, they are still our bosses. <laughs> uh, and they do control budget, but 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 um, uh, I think uh, the you know I think for the most part there there, there was this order. P people may not know this, but when uh, just as when the president walks into a room, everybody stands up. When the secretary walks in the room, everybody's supposed to stand up. And it took me about a month to beat it out of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't don't stand up. <laughs> Uh, because, and these are the career folks who were growing up with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to ask about the big part of the Department of Energy that's, that's associated with controlling the nuclear enterprise in, in the U.S. And I know people often don't think of that as, as in the center of the, of the department's agenda, but, it, but I know it's a big piece. And and, and how did you come up to speed in thinking of yourself as kind of the guardian of the nation's nuclear assets? Yeah, well, actually, I had a head start. Um, after there, there was initial assignments with Juan Ho Lee potentially being a spy, in the end, those charges were dropped. But, but there was great political um, introspection, people protesting. And there was a debate as to whether they should bring the, the nuclear part of the Department of Energy out of the Department of Energy, give it to the military. And um, calmer heads prevailed and they said, we'll give it, keep in Department of Energy, make it semi-autonomous. Uh, when that was started, and I think it was uh, uh, 19, 1990, year 2000, somewhere around then they, um, they started a uh, senior advisory panel to the director of the NSA. And I agreed to join that. 
Uh, it was actually Condi Rice who was twisting my arm and, and Pete Panofsky to, to join this. Good, good uh, choice and, on Condi's part. <laughs> and Peef also was a member. And, um, and so it was during that time that I got to know about the nuclear issues, the nuclear arsenal, uh, you know, the, the requirements, the stockpile stewardship. So when I became Secretary of Energy, I had been an advisor for a couple of years. And do you feel like that, um, that, that part of the agenda has the resources that it needs and are there, are there major decisions coming up in terms of the, the uh, nuclear assets that need to be made? Well, there are two parts of the nuclear. One is what you're talking about, which is the military aspect. So, so every year, the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of Energy have to hand sign certify that the stockpile is safe, uh, secure, uh, and um, reliable, uh, which means essentially um, it's very hard to steal these weapons. If you could steal the weapons, you can't make them go kaboom. But if we want to make them kaboom, they're, they're going to go kaboom. Uh, that, uh, all those things are important issues. The kaboom part is important because we realize that much of the nuclear stockpile was based on designs three or four decades ago. Uh, and there was a constant maintenance refurbishment of using the exact same parts as per an unofficial treaty, but many of the parts actually involved tube electronics. <laughs> wow. Uh, so that's how out of date it was. And so it, it's, it's like really keeping uh, some very old car in, in top operating condition. Uh, now, since that time, it's recognized that you're not bending any treaties if you replace them with transistors, because it doesn't give you any new capability. The new capability debate is always one that continues. Um, one example of new capability that the military wanted that I pushed against was the ability to dial up and down the yield of the warhead. You can actually, we, we understand these, this technology well enough so you can actually dial down to 5,000, five kilotons, five and, or up to, you know, 100 kilotons or more. And uh, I was against it because I did not want a five kiloton nuke because a five kiloton nuke could open up the possibility that <clears throat> think it might be more likely you might use it. And now sure. that at five kilotons, you can use a conventional explosive. Uh, so I was against it. Um, uh, now, after I left, after Ernie left, uh, it's now done. <laughs> this new capability is there. Uh, there were uh, enough more people after I left pushing back hard against that. Um, so that's the nuclear part. And, you know, how do you maintain the, the safety, security, reliability that we have to certify every year? Then there's the civilian waste part that people don't realize. These are our nuclear civilian reactors. Uh, there's spent fuel. Uh, there was a contractual obligation that the Department of Energy would take um, the spent fuel off the hands of the um, it's usually utility companies that have these nuclear reactors uh, at a certain date. We pass that date and there are penalties. So we, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on penalties because we haven't figured out uh, an effective disposition of the spent fuel. There was a proposed Yucca Mountain repository that turned out not to be a good site. It was politically selected, not geologically selected and as soon as they started burrowing into Yucca Mountain, they found that water dripped out of the tunnels, into the tunnels. Water and nuclear waste don't, are not a good mix. Uh, this was done in the previous administration and we at, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab did a lot of hydrology studies to figure out what would happen. And the previous secretary and deputy secretary were as shocked as I was. And I remember seeing the deputy secretary, the previous Deputy Secretary's office, and he said, "Steve, you can't believe this. You, you know, this water dripping mess. They're gonna. Their solution is to put a, you know, a 
10 billion dollar titanium shield in the mountain to protect the water wow. Wow. and we both and i said that's ridiculous that's not going to last ten thousand years <laughs> let alone a million years so you know this is nuts we need a better place <laughs> uh so, so there were there, so, so that's an unsolved problem, and and then finally an un, uh, unsolved problem is the uh, radioactive waste as part of the Cold War legacy from World War II into the '60s and '70s, where we were making all of these bombs. Uh, there's a lot of radioactive, high-level radioactive waste that was generated, sitting in in tanks. Uh, for example, in Hanford, Washington, that yeah. also needs to be disposed of. These are big, big things and uh, not fully, you know, we have to figure out a way. Uh, we spend five to six billion dollars a year dealing with that waste. Uh, but during the time and just before I was secretary, the, you know, think five billion dollars or six billion dollars. Then think uh, if you had a small R&D program that could find a much better effective, cost-effective way of doing it, wouldn't it be worth it? Yeah. Okay. And and so, so you know, think, okay, $6 billion is, what's a good R&D program? You know, 10%, 5%. It was being nibbled down to $100,000. Wow. <laughs> it's like in the, the third or fourth decimal place because the contractors who had these huge grants didn't want better ways. Yeah. Uh, and they just wanted the, the billion per year coming into the state of Washington, going into Tennessee, going to South Carolina, literally, yeah. uh, because it, 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 it greased the economy. Yeah. Um, we're getting to the stage where I'm going to open it up to audience questions, but there's a couple more things that I, okay. I, I, I really want to get to. So please, uh, audience members, uh, enter questions in the Q and A and, and we'll get to those soon. Um, one, one thing I, this last, uh, comment you made about the way that pressure from big contractors and keeps things going sort of in train and how hard it is to launch new initiatives that let people come up with more creative, better solutions. What, did you find that it's just kind of force of personality that lets you bring innovations in or, or how do you deal with this um, complicated jungle of vested interests? Uh, now I'm trained as a scientist. So what I would do is I would, uh, uh, start pretty intensive reviews, technical reviews. Uh, and the le in the summer of 2012, I started a big review of looking for better solutions uh, to the Cold War legacy waste. Uh, in 2010, I think I recommend to the um, president that he form a blue ribbon commission to look at uh, better solutions to the civilian waste problem. It was, uh, and uh, they came up with excellent recommendations. Uh, I tried to sell it. I was having, having good success selling to Energy and Water, the Senate leadership. Um, uh, at the time, Lamar Alexander, Lisa Murkowski on the Republican side, Jeff Bingham and, and Diane Transstein on the Democratic side, um, to try to actually rethink the Nuclear Waste Act because that was preventing a lot of things from happening. And, uh, and so those are some of the things. Um, it, it's slow. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> Senator Feinstein said, you know, Steve, we'll back you. This is very important. I think you're going in the right direction. If you promise to us, you'll stay until the job is completed and said, Diane, that might take 15 years. You know how my wife feels about DC. <laughs> so so I, I, um, I, I want to ask one more question before we shift to the questions from the audience. And I know that a really big issue during the uh, your early days in, in Washington was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I think that many people regard that as a, as a real model of how to 
solve a, a national crisis with a with a team effort, and I and I know you led that. It, help us understand kind of how that process came together and how it worked. Okay, so um, uh, in late April uh, there was the explosion and the start of the. Um, very big oil leak. I had made a suggestion to BP, uh, a technical suggestion, just as an interested bystander, because they didn't know the state of the valves. This is a stack of valves one mile deep at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there were no sensors to tell you how much they were open or closed. And so I suggested you use gamma rays from cobalt 60. You can go through this much steel. And so just like a dental x-ray, you can actually image the state of the valves. Now, uh, that was not looked upon favorably by the BP. They kind of laughed about it, made a joke. Well, he's from Lawrence Berkeley lab. And so he's into gamma rays. Uh, the Hulk was made. It. <laughs> um, but then a day later, they said, you know, he may have a point there. So they began to think about it. Somehow, I didn't tell the president. Uh, he got wind of this. And at the end of a uh, cabinet meeting, he goes up to me and says, Chu, go down there and help them stop the leak. He says, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> and so I decided, what did I want to do? And I decided to form a little team of people. Now, actually, so the, this is not... A regulatory thing, the, the Deepwater Horizon, uh, the jurisdiction was in the Department of Interior because it was offshore. Uh, and the, the president went to me because I was a practicing scientist and he knew I was an active scientist. So, so what I decided to do was to form an informal group of uh, about a half a dozen people um, that said, look, we're not, I didn't want oil engineer experts. I wanted people who could really think out of the box um, as, uh, and are quick learners. And so again, it was kind of, I talked to a few others and said, okay, these are the people I want, call them up um, and said, you know, this could be a half-time job for the next, we, we don't know how long but uh, it's an emergency situation. Um, and everybody said, yes. And I said, oh, by the way, or they said, well, I have to check with the chair of my department. I have to check with my spouse. I have to do this, uh, I said, fine. Uh, and then the first meeting will be tomorrow, 8 a.m. in Houston. So everybody said yes and showed up. And so what we did is we started with diagnostics, but then I quickly realized that there was, they were doing things that were kind of scary and adding more risk. Uh, and so after an attempt, a failed attempt to try to throw down junk into the oil well uh, to counter the flow of the oil and gas coming up, we had laid out a plan that they were gonna make certain measurements they could only do while they were engaged in this process. They didn't do it. I had a little temper tantrum. It was in the control room of BP, you know, at 1 a.m. in the morning. So look, we agreed that we we're going to do it this way. From here on in, you have to take these measurements. Uh, and Thad Allen was there and they knew, you know, the Secretary of Energy had a direct line to the president. So they said, okay, we'll do it. Now those measurements turned out to be crucial in getting solutions. Uh, but after that, I told Thad Allen, and said, from here on in, BP doesn't do anything until our little, you know, we give it approval. So they had to run everything by us and we prevented them from doing a lot of things that would have been in, really increased the risk of, um, of that. Um, my little team said, you don't want to do this. If you start doing that, you're going to assume some of the responsibility. I said, it's okay. If I get fired for trying to do the best, you know, the, the information I had to do that, that would be okay. Uh, but you had to be in there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is not a review panel looking, looking at a historical record. You are really trying to help them stop the leak. Now in the ensuing couple of months, they began to really trust us, started throwing us the raw data and we were really in there. 
and and a couple of times they said, you're right, we that was too risky and you, we look for other solutions. Um, there were no votes in the committee. Uh, we discussed it and then I made a decision. But I said, look, uh, it will be on me. I'm not gonna hide behind votes. And and what most bureaucrats like to do actually is hide behind committees. Sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 and I said, look, you know, if I get fired for trying to do the right thing, I get fired. Uh, but so be it. Um, thinking privately to myself, someone will maybe hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect that's a safe assumption. But, but it sounds like, um, you know, what, what you're really saying is that taking responsibility for launching new things is kind of the, the key to success. And maybe the for the new administration, it will be as well. Right. I think, I think if you want to get something done, yes, take responsibility if things go wrong. You know, it's the old saying, you know, success has many uh, fathers and mothers, <laughs> but failure is an orphan. Yeah. <laughs> you, in order to get things done, it's, you know, the buck stops wherever it stops. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for answering my questions. Let me turn to some of the audience questions, which in, in some ways are, are, are much better. And I, I, I want to start um, with one from a, a faculty colleague, Inez Azevedo. And she says, I'd like to know how uh, we at Stanford can be better positioned to brief and inform the administration and agencies on solving some of the key challenges that our faculty are working on, namely climate change, explicitly include environmental justice and policy design, innovation and R&D for sustainable energy and transitions to low carbon sustainable energy systems. Right, so there are two ways. It, it's, it usually works through either the agencies that are relevant to this. This would be things like the Department of Energy, but then you need to get inside the Department of Energy, but you really need the Department of Energy to ask. Right, because advice given when you're when not asked is doesn't uh, is quite often ignored, and so so I think uh, in it depending on how the Department of Energy fills up, uh, I, I think there is a deep commitment by the new administration to to uh, really mitigate the risks of climate change, uh, and also uh, adaptation, which is going to have to be part of this. The other way is through OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy, and through what's called PCAS, which is the Presidential Commission that advises. Um, that, that's more academic route. And so PCAS especially uh, could, would look towards looking around at the resources uh, Course, including the intellectual resources of the United States to give advice on policy. And so that is uh, something, and the good news is I'm very happy with the appointments that they made uh, for the Office of Society. You know, Director of OSTP is also a Presidential Science Advisor, and, uh, and they also took our advice, among others, uh, where we said, uh, elevated to a cabinet position. So that's now a cabinet position. And so with those appointments, um, uh, the Biden administration it says, you know, we really want to tap into the science uh, knowledge base in the United States and in the world to, to help us solve those problems. Um, so that's a very good sign. Uh, and, and I, I um, they had asked me in the transition, I formed a little group to give them uh, a very short list of names for both of those, uh, where we also advise that uh, they elevate to a cabinet position. Uh, uh, and they seem to have taken our advice seriously. <laughs> that's so that's yeah. very good. Uh, and so, you know, I will, I'm, so I'm very hopeful. And I think, that the question is very important because, um, it, you know, and I can do what I can do in order to get get the agencies 
uh, NOAA, Department of Energy, EPA. There's a number of agencies related to environment, and climate, and things of that nature to try to get them uh, to you know there used to be a lot of committees that were one by one disbanded in the previous administration. Uh, but not only just to have the communities, to take them very seriously. Can I just follow up on, on the question for Minaj about the um, opportunity for scientists to be involved in things like advisory panels, in Capitol Hill briefings, in um, sort of direct outreach and are, would you encourage faculty to be m more active in that sort of part of the space or, or is, it, is it better to work kind of through the, the, the more established, um, you know, if you're invited to be a part of an advisory panel or a national academy study? No, I think there's a role if one wants to be more proactive. Um, uh, certainly if you're invited to be part of an advisory committee, uh, do it uh, and hope, hope that it will be taken seriously. Um, uh, but there's also a role that I think can be played among people who live in sciences who live in their communities um, to go to high schools, go to this, go to that, and, and you know, talk about some of the issues. Um, uh, in the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, we're trying to start a program, uh, sort of a grassroots program where uh, in order to develop trust um, in science, uh, it's better to have the, your neighbor talking about this <laughs> and not someone flying in uh, from the East Coast or the West Coast or wherever, uh, landing for a day pontificating and flying back out. Uh, I think trust, uh, human trust begins by shared experiences. You know, your kids go to sock, play soccer or a band or whatever. And, and so in these informal events, you get to know people of different political persuasions in a way. And, and it's with that trust that you can begin to communicate. Uh, and, and this communication is first of all, so scientists, yeah, now uh, this is kind of a quasi non-issue <laughs> of Stanford professors in the sense that uh, there are not predominantly two very different realities and a set of knowledge bases that we, the nation now suffers from. And so, yeah. so, so it's not as, as important here as it would be in other places where you really have very divergent uh, sets of beliefs and sets of quote data. Um, yeah. Super interesting. Let, let, let me go on. Uh, this, this is a question from Todd Logan about um, the, the role of the private sector. Is it, what priorities should the DOE have to contribute to addressing climate change? And are additional large loans necessary to support companies and innovations to reduce carbon emissions in many areas of the economy, for example, industrial processes? Okay, so uh, now this is more my uh, policy philosophy rather than uh, strict science question. That's, that's great. That's why, why we have you. <laughs> uh, I, I personally think of public sector money, taxpayer money is best spent in two ways. One way is in research where companies are not willing uh, to do the fundamental research that creates a basis for technology that will help solve the problem. Example, we would love to have a uh, diamond transistor. By diamond transistor, I really mean CVD diamonds that are doped because it has a very high voltage standoff. It has very good heat conductivity. You could you could do, you could revolutionize DC transmission, low loss, high voltage transmission with diamond transistors. You know, uh, the people who make high voltage transmission equipment are not gonna do a lot of research in making, it's a materials question. How do you dope diamond? Um, when I was secretary of energy, we were doing that, but mostly on things that were more short-term achievable like gallium nitride and silicon carbide transistors. Uh, so research. Absolutely, uh, in many areas. The other way is, I think since most of the energy 
and carbon emitting industries, including agriculture is a big one, are private. Uh, that you want to you want to set policies that stimulate investments in this private sector, stimulate a farmer to adapt uh, uh, lower means of agricultural production that dramatically lower the CO2. And that's done again, partly by research and using te newer technologies that are now rapidly emerging and maybe some tax incentives with a, a sunset clause uh, just as, you know, with the tax incentives for electric vehicles, after a certain company sells a certain number of models, their, their taxing goes away. It's to bootstrap it, to get it going, but after that, you've got to live on the quality of your product. Um, I'm more in favor of that than spending large amounts of money in direct expenditures to, to subsidize. You really want to get the private sector to invest their own money with sunset clauses. Um, the good news is right now, there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines. Unlike 2009, where all the capital had vanished because they were got gobbled up in bad loans, uh, we're in a different position. So after we get out of COVID uh, and can go back to working full time, uh, how do you stimulate the investment of that huge amount of private capital, which you know, can great, greatly leverage. Now, in terms of the loans, the loan program turned out, I think in hindsight to be a very successful thing. Wall Street wouldn't touch loans to large solar and wind projects. These were 500 million up to a billion dollar loans. They said, no, it's too risky. So we invested in those. Um, they in large part paid off and we're gaining back revenues from the low interest rate from the loans. They're turning the loan program into the black. That's all good. We, Tesla survived in our loan. They would have gone bankrupt within one month. Uh, if we had not announced our loan within a month, they would have vanished. Um, Nissan developed the leaf in part with our loan. And so those things actually did pay off. Uh, there were other things, you know, Solyndra that failed. That was a notable failure. Uh, but, but it did actually leverage money in a very effective way. Now, the downside of the federal loan program is that there's lots of bureaucracy and it becomes very cumbersome. And if we're going to do it again, somehow we have to streamline the bureaucracy uh, because it, it's it, so... Uh, companies, it, it's sort of a, uh, a loan of last resort to many private companies. Um, yeah. And if you excuse this, it's when you have a federal loan like that, uh, during the whole time you have the loan, uh, the government has, it's like a colonoscopy without anesthesia for the whole time of the loan. <laughs> it's a pain. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. Uh, so you want to streamline it um, uh, as much as possible in some way, because it, you have to be responsible, but, but it can't be uh, as cumbersome as it is. But it sounds like sort of hypervigilance about preventing things from getting too bureaucratic and making sure that you don't use the loan as a way to bail out failing companies that should fail. That's right, absolutely. But it, it, is, it turned out to be very, very good and, uh, and highly leveraged money. Uh, but, you know, in addition to loans, the loans could be a possibility. I think providing uh, companies with sunset incentives. Uh, so their business plan means they get into it, but it's not. So when the subsidy ends, they get out. But, but with the intent of uh, making a, a sustaining business. Yeah. Let, let me ask a, another audience question that, that follows up on this theme. This one's from Ellen Chu. Uh, do you think the changes in DOE culture under you and Ernie survived the Trump administration and can persist under President Biden? Yeah, another good question. I would say um, uh, a lot of the long-term career people were driven out through terrible means of, you know, the senior career people, you can't fire them, but you can transfer them and uh, to different locations or very undesirable jobs, and then they quit. Uh, 
and these are people with, you know, as Republicans and Democrats, different administrations have different philosophies. They could weather the storm, but they couldn't weather this one. Um, I think in the end, uh, you not only want to restore the culture, you want to actually say that, you know, the, a lot of the business of the government is done in the agencies, which are in the executive branch. And to build a core of federal civil servants who are truly excellent would be my dream. Uh, and, and you don't need, you know, when people get hired in the government jobs, they think, oh my gosh, they're starting to think of pension. You know, usually 30 year olds don't think of pensions. I know <laughs> I wasn't thinking of pensions then. Uh, and not only that, um, you, if you could get them for five years, three years, 10 years, and they move on, uh, that would be good. It would be a good thing. I wanted, you know, RPE was written into the program of RPE. They can only be there for three years and then they move out. But it became such a well-run organization that it became a badge of honor to be an RPE. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and this, so I was saying with the time I was there, this is what we want in the Department of Energy. You work in the Department of Energy five or 10 years. You're one of the select few privilege enough <laughs> and you learn so much while you're there that you become very much more employable and that's what you actually want. You want people with this knowledge base to go back to the private sector, academia, industry, wherever. Uh, let, that let would me, be the dream. Let me ask one, one question that, that sort of follows up directly on that. This one's from Bruce Carney and it's about the federal workforce. What are the biggest barriers to recruiting mid-career scientists to work for the federal government either in management or individual contributor roles? Is it mostly about compensation or having to relocate or something else? And it sounds like you're saying it's really about how empowering the job experience is in a large extent. Yeah. I, I think what you, you, know, you do could take a salary cut and people are willing to take a salary cut if they think they're doing something very, very useful. The, you know, the uh, funds can be used to help relocate. And it turned out I was not, I was, not in the top 300 of those people working in the Department of Energy in terms of compensation when I was secretary. Why? Because I couldn't get the relocation stuff. <laughs> uh, so, um, so people are willing to do that if they think that uh, some real good can come out of it because in a government position, in a, in a well-run agency, you have tremendous influence and the ability to uh, change the world in ways uh, that you couldn't as an academic. Uh, so it's the bureau protecting, you know, their supervisors have to block and tackle for them. <laughs> and to really keep the bureaucracy from dragging them down. And I remember in the first year I was Secretary of Energy, I had an all hands meeting, just you know, feedback. And one of the people raised his hands, Mr. Secretary, can you stop all the, well, let me see if I can remember the exact words, all the blood sucking soul draining that we have to put up with? <laughs> yeah, wow. And it said, I'm working on it. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> I guess that's probably the most important thing is, is somebody who's there, uh, that, who the rank and file understand is on their side. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because that was the mood. He said, you know, we, we, you know, we're, it's about doing the job and empowering people to do the job and knowing that they can be, become effective. Yeah. We're, we're, we're right at the end here. Let me ask one more question that's about your personal journey and then uh, and just close with a thank you. So uh, this one's from Stephen Shuken. Uh, how did your contact beyond academic, academia to government first begin? Do you have advice for academicians who are interested in getting involved in government? Um, I, do, I, can, I suspect how I began. Uh, I did not, I wasn't in politics. I didn't campaign for anybody. I didn't know President Obama. Uh, I think uh, when I was uh, director of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, be, people began to take notice somehow. And I think a number of people uh, who were connected to uh, the president-elect 
uh, started saying, you, you want to look seriously at this person. Uh, they had, as, they, as you mentioned, they never plucked a scientist to become Secretary of Energy. Uh, president Obama was a different president. Uh, and so, uh, and so through, it, through, it, through that, um, people at the University of Chicago knew me well, uh, things like that, that I think I got on his radar screen. Uh, but if you look at his appointment, many of his appointments, he was looking far and wide for, uh, not for the usual cast of characters, not for the usual, um, either rich people or politicians who lent support early on, those are the, many of the people who, be, who become secretaries. Uh, he, was, he was trying to make different appointments. Um, and, yeah. you know, uh, and, and I said, you know, my wife finally said, I'm, I'm going back to Stanford. I hope you join me. <laughs> uh, so I had to tell the president that I loved working with him, but I, I could not. Uh, he said he understood. And we talked a little bit about uh, what would, given the deadlock Congress, uh, Republican Congress, what um, what he would recommend he should do. And at the last night, I said, look, you get, you get a lot of credit hiring me. You didn't know me. I was a scientist. I didn't do politics. I don't do politics. Uh, I know a lot of the people in your inner circle don't want that to happen because scientists uh, feel, you know, uh, they, they work in their, their compass is, you know, scientific truth. <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it, and, you know, it's something maybe they felt it's harder to control. Uh, uh, and I said, you get a lot of credit for it. Do it again. And he did it again. Yeah. Well, Steve, Chu, thank, thank you so much for, uh, uh inspirational conversation and and really uh compelling advice about what what each of us can do and what each of us can aspire to to uh, make the government work better and address some key challenges so i i really appreciate the insight and i i i know that the rest of the audience and i i, I hope that the audience included many many people who have a chance to uh, to be of service of the the way you've described yeah. before we close i want to just one, one last closing comment, uh, you know, going to government doesn't mean it's a life careers thing. Go, you can go to government two years, four years, five years, 10 years, two years, four years, then you can go back to what you're doing. And, and it's sort of national service. Uh, uh, now it turned out for me going into government for the time four and third years was a growing enriching experience. I learned so much. I thought it was give back time, but it turned out, uh, <laughs> it was good for the way I saw the world and, and opened my intellectual horizons even more. And so, so that's another thing that you can think of. You know, it's, it, it's like, you know, going to the armed forces for a brief amount of time, not because you want to be a career soldier, but it, it's time to, you know, national service. And that, again, if we, we have people like that, that would be great. That, what a wonderful way to close. Thank you so, so much. Um, Reminder, our next conversation, March 11th, Pat Brown, Impossible Foods. I also want to just thank the fabulous Woods staff that supported today's conversation. Molly Field, Athena Serapio, plus Justin and Evan from Cypress Media. And thanks to everybody in the audience for a really wonderful conversation.